It's working. So, uh, should I stand up there or should I stand down here? You don't mind if I stand down here? So I don't accidentally pitch over the edge. So, um, this is actually the first public talk I've done in two years. There's a lot has been incubating. Um, and I'm going to introduce something old and then something new. Um, the old project is called the Evil Grid or Evolution Grid, and the successor is called the Genesis Engine. And how does this fit uh, evolution in the cloud or conscious in the cloud? This is a conception that I've actually been working on since I was 14 years old. In uh, 1976, I was wandering around in the sagebrush behind my parents' house in Kamloops, B.C., Canada, and I had this flash, which was, what would the coolest nerd project be to work on? And I looked down at all the plants and bugs and things, and, well, how on earth did all this get self-assembled to get going? How did molecules get together and make this? And that became my uh, kind of life direction. I started on a PhD in 1985 at University of Southern California, and I thought I had it all together. I had a VAX 11750, and old-timers would only remember what that thing is, a Tektronix color display and an ARPANET account. And I thought, now I can build a chemodynamic simulator that might show emergence. <laughs> then I looked around. There were no libraries, no tools, no field, no colleagues, no publications. A few self-replicating automata, uh, books and papers by Russians and by a guy named Johnny von Neumann. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm too early. I'm too early. So 22 years later, I restarted the project after hosting conferences on this theme and building a, a network and doing a decade of work with NASA. I restarted the project uh, when there was sufficient. So for all of you uh, PhD students who are taking a long time uh, there is hope. <laughs> and I finished the PhD finally uh, from the original conception in 2011 that I had started in 85 and had the idea in 1976. But it's an ongoing story. So there is hope for us, us middle-aged PhD people. So life, intelligent or not, how much, if any, is out there? Um, one of the mechanisms that has been used to ask that question, not necessarily answered, is the famous Drake equation. Everybody knows what the Drake equation here? It's a set of probabilities of, you know, rate of star formation, a fraction of the stars that have planets, et cetera, et cetera. And you add them all up for a galaxy, you know, length of, the last one's length of time, such civilizations uh, release detectable signals. So it's a it's a, by Frank Drake, an idea of how many signals are we going to detect in our radio astronomy gear. And um, you can vary all these probabilities all you want. Um, I chose uh, to expand upon, you know, the function uh, L, loopy L there, the fraction of the above that actually go on to develop life at some point. So how many life-generating places are there in the universe or in, in a given galaxy? And so expanding upon the Drake equation, it came down to, if you're looking at chemical life, if you're looking at aqueous chemical life, what are the uh, factors that have to be in there? So this is a miniaturization of the Drake equation in, into this one function. Uh, what, how it has to be there in, in, in any system so that life emerges. If something is missing, life won't emerge. So what are the minimum? What is the minimum that you need? And I'll come back to this. So this is just a little, little preview of, of this concept. So uh, back in 2008, uh, I, with the team, our NASA team, we had a little extra time, so we produced this fun YouTube video, which I'll show you, which is the conception of what if you could use computers to do a gigantic simulation, a chemical simulation, in digitally, to then witness uh, with all the properties and origin of life inside the network. Now, this is a great theme in science fiction. Artificial life people working on this, you know, uh, great science fiction writer, writers like Greg Egan and whatnot. This is a, a common theme. Uh, and then 
they'll take the next step. Since you can't, simulated the chemistry pretty faithfully, could you then fabricate that life in some kind of 3D printer? And so that was this idea. So I'll, I'll roll this uh, fun movie for you. The uh, Evo Grid, a whimsical view of a hypothetical evolution machine. Here we see the Evo Grid simulation cube underlaid by boxes and lots and lots of processors. And as we come in, we see there's particles in the cube. The particles are starting to interact. And then suddenly we see a doubling of the processors. And then a doubling again. And we're starting to see some interesting phenomena. So let's dive in and see if we can see something happening. And it looks like with our little observer camera, we're finding something interesting going on. A little bit of self-organization is happening here. Oh, a vesicle has formed. And it's got something inside it. So let's go on a few billion generations, and uh, we have something a little more interesting going on in vesicles. Yeah, and a little bit more structure in this one. And a few billion generations later, We've got uh, a little bit of behavior going on. It's uh, more of an entity. And uh, let's, uh, we've got a pretty complex entity here. Let's push this along and uh, put it into our scanner. The scanner's been taken apart digitally. It's a digitally evolved being, of course, and builds its uh, little capsule of XML data. Now we're going to transmit it to our NFT now. <laughs> Acme Nanofab is taking in CO2, ammonia, and good old water, H2O, and it's going to fabricate our digitally evolved entity into a creature of chemistry, making sheets and strings and reacting parts and channels. It looks like our creature is finished with being printed. And out the end of the glass tube will come our fab entity. Ready for a swan dive into a beaker. And in the beaker is a formulated chemical soup designed to be like the original Sim Cube. And let's see if our creature is recognizing the, the chemicals and it's uh, running out for them. And it's swimming off, so it seems to be up to a good start in a new life in the world of the molecule. So this was the conception that we put out to the world about uh, a pathway to a second genesis of life, you know, starting in the digital domain. And then, the next one, I went to talk to many people about this. And one of the people I went to talk to is Freeman Dyson at the Institute for Advanced Study. And I've been going to see him now and then to show him progress on the work. And his comment, the simulation should be truly messy, i.e. nature is not clean and neat as you are showing in the movie. Cells are more like dirty water surrounded by, gar surrounded, uh, by garbage bags. And of course, if you read his ideas about the double origins of life in his book, you'll, you'll understand what that means and many other comments. So for example, uh, while I was at the Institute, I went into the archives and I went into uh, Robert Oppenheimer's files about the uh, electronic computer project at Princeton, which produced this machine, which is, was widely copied and may have been the first true digital computer. It had registers and serial processing of commands and secondary and um, tertiary memory, and this is John von Neumann standing next to it. And this machine, so I went through all these files and found out this, oh, this is a contingency design. This was just to get something that worked for more than 30 minutes at a time and actually could do real things. And we're stuck with that architecture. And it turns out that that architecture is really poor for doing nature, really poor. In fact, it's of the seven properties of computing systems that Peter Bentley at UCL, at University College London, lays out in the seven properties of natural systems. None of them are, are work. And so it's like computers are, are incredibly bad at doing natural systems. So 
back to building life. Are you gonna, you're, you, so in some sense, you can't use computers to simulate chemistry to any degree to help you with origin of life stuff. You just can't. We're, we're four orders of magnitude off, and we may never be able to do it. So building life the hard way in chemicals, what if you could do chemical experiments all at once, but marry them with computers? This is the famous Miller-Urey um, simulation of the reducing atmosphere back in 1953 showing the uh, amino acids that they produced. And they produced 21, and people didn't realize at the time. They, they looked at the, the vials today, and they actually produced a huge number of amino acids, uh, more than they found in the 50s. Um, this is Steen Rasmussen in Denmark proposing radical new ways of trying, in chemistry, trying to create a chemical life cycle that would create a kind of a genesis. But this, this architecture turned out to be too radical to even be doable in the first stages in the lab, and the, the project lost, you know, it, it finished its funding, I don't think, with any significant progress. Uh, but this is the equipment they're using for their chemical origins of life. This is the kind of gear you use. Not, you're not sitting at a screen, you're doing basically glassware work and running things through very expensive tests and missing things most of the time. So this was the process by which one lab was attempting, attempting to do it. So how easy is this going to be? How easy is it going to be? It turns out it's incredibly hard. Individual origin of life teams focus on one narrow area like polymerization or finding metabolic cycles or uh, working on vesicles and compartmentalization. They tend to work in very, very narrow areas with experiments done by hand, like this guy's doing. And Penny Boston commented, she's a, a well-known uh, cave explorer looking for life deep in the earth, and she, she commented that you just have to find a model that uh, where in chemistry you can support ever-increasing levels of emergent complexity and that nature had this computer to do it with, you know, and had at least several hundred million years, even if it may have gotten the, through panspermia, the organisms may have come from elsewhere, but it had an awfully big system to, to make an origin of life happen. So here you then go down in the sort of Craig Venter mode and say, What's a minimal cell that actually works? What parts do you actually have to have? And this is a, one model of it. It's a lot of moving parts. It's a heck of a lot of moving parts that have to work with 99.9% 99% accuracy for this thing not to fall apart and do the very difficult job of mitosis, of dividing, the extremely different technical job of dividing. So how do you get from basic simple mixtures of atoms to something that's like the Queen Mary of complexity. The simplest cell is still a vast machine with 100 billion carbon atoms. How do you do it? How do you map that computer onto this one? You know, there's a computer from my collection, a Commodore PET. Many of us grew up on these. They, our computers aren't much more powerful than that in relative terms. So in 2008 through 2011, our team built a distributed artificial chemistry simulation called the Evo Grid. And we first ran it in my barn on uh, basically old servers until we burned every machine out. And then UC San Diego donated a, a rack of about 30 cores for us to complete the work. What we did was we said, all right, since you cannot, you, you, you have to simulate nature to its true, in a faithful way. You can't just do a Conway's game of life. You have to simulate atomistic environments and as, as faithfully as you can. And we chose the simplest one, which is interstellar chemistry, cosmochemistry, where you have a lot of free atoms moving around. You have ices and dust and everything too. You can't simulate those, they're too big. But atomistic chemistry is a very simple soup. Very few reactions happen in, in interstellar chemistry, but enough happened over hundreds of million years to make the organic molecules that you're made out of. So by the time solar systems accrete, they're crammed with all this stuff. I mean, you can, you can uh, look at the sky and you can see all this material gradually forming over time. So our whole goal in the EvoGrid was to see in an atomistic soup how does nature wiggle along in this extremely noisy environment of just atoms going every which way 
How can you cut through the complexity and the noise to get accretion of molecular bonds faster and faster? Because otherwise, none of these experiments are going to finish in a human lifetime. So this was the result, and it turned out to you know, allow me to finish the PhD finally. And this chart, the second chart here showing the staircasing was the signature in experiment number six that ran for uh, about 40 days nonstop where we found that nature uses, or at least in this simulation, uses some combination of stochastic hill climbing to get around in those hilly landscapes and, and to form bonds and to keep the bonds formed. And stochastic hill climbing is you get up to a maximum, which might say, I've got three bonds formed. And then you wiggle off of it, and you try a thousand or a million more pathways, finding a ridge to the next complexity, which has four bonds formed. Hallelujah. And then it wiggles off and down. And it's that, you see that happening in evolution. You see that happening in social systems, in economic systems. It's stochastic hill climbing, and it worked in the, really the most noisy environment we could find to simulate in nature, which is an atomistic soup. So here's experiment number one, just a few products after months of running. Here's experiment number six, rocking number 141 molecules formed in there. Incredible. It was a full order of magnitude. So the next step was, and I call this kind of the cosmic wiggle, the wiggle that nature takes through space to accrete complexity and hold on to it. So, but then uh, I was sitting on a park bench in Montpellier and Zan and I were at this conference and I was depressed because I thought computers are just not up to it. They're just not going to be able to simulate enough digital stuff to show us how life may have started and this whole thing is a bust. I found an optimization method, but in my lifetime I'm never going to see it. And then popped into my head was this vision of millions of chemical experiments, millions or trillions of them somehow controlled by computers doing the same thing as we were doing. So that the molecules do the walking, they simulate themselves. And the computers are the eyes and the selectors and the scorers, which they're good at. They're not good at simulation. And they help run it, very much like PCR, very much like the Human Genome Project very much like what's called combinatorial chemistry. So was born this concept of a genesis engine, a hybrid between computers and chemistry that is tuned also toward the human mind, the designer of the experiment who has teleological end goals, which may or may not be met. And I drew some really simple diagrams of, well, well here's your chemical experiments on little shelves. And, and these little shelves could be controlled by a laptop and then some shelf is heated and some is vibrated and another shelf is, has more things added to it. You know, these are just little balloons. I mean, this is a very cartoony conception. And then you might combine the results of experiments, but you could, you could monitor the best performing little balloon, put stuff in and out of it, and wait for it to become a richer mixture and then combine it, then go on to more little shelves of balloons. And here's a more logical, you know, here we have a set of millions of experiments around catalysis and millions around vesicle formation and millions of them around RNA formation. And they're all going through these gates and they're going into big soups. Like, these were the best ways we found to make long chain RNA and here are the best ways we found to make balloon or bubbles out of lipid, and here's the best ways we found to create a metabolic cycle, and we'll dump them into a big soup and then see what happens coming out of the, out of the big soup. So this was this idea of fully automating origin of life experiments across all the experiments, chaining them together, and then looking for the results. And actually built one of these shelves in 2011 to, to see how we could do it on the total cheap for 80 bucks. Uh, it turns out that at the same time, Dave Deemer, who is my, my colleague at UC Santa Cruz, which I've just joined as of last week, um, built something far more sophisticated. And this is his, their first step at doing a Genesis engine. And here, what they've done is they've, and this is a big thing for Origin of Life people. They haven't done automation before. Um, they haven't done architectures before. It's all been pretty much by hand. They've been doing 19th century chemistry, basically. But 
the revolution in, from affymetrics and from combinatorial chemistry is starting to come into the origin of life field, which is an extremely underfunded field. I mean, these people are doing this on, as a sideline mostly. There's very little funding for this. But they bored well plates, uh, uh, well holes in this aluminum plate, uh, found a $40 stepper motor to drive this, and then they could, with one set of leads, they could place water containing lipid, phospholipids, with another set they could blast them with CO2 to evaporate the water and force the lipids to go down into these liquid crystal matrices between which are captured um, basically nucleotides which then form RNA. And then they would re-infuse that with water and it would sort of bulk up and you'd see these long chain RNA molecules and then they would do it again. This is simulating uh, hot water geysers that are all over the world land-based uh, geysers in Kamchatka and Mount Lass and whatnot where the geyser shoots up and sprays amphiphilic molecules, lipids, onto rocks. They dry out and you get this wonderful layering. And in between are these wonderful factories to make these informational molecules. And it's been Dave's thrust of his entire career is to show how this works. So this is his first automated way of simulating a hot spring. Now there's no computer watching this. There's no computer that's saying, oh, I like that experiment in the 15th well plate. I'll start a million more. As you can see, there's very few well plates, but it's, a very, it's, a first, it's the start to building a genesis engine. So back to the formula, or the formulation. Uh, this has now evolved into, and this was developed with Working with Dave Deemer and Stuart Kaufman and a number of others, uh, we asked the question, what must you have in your origin of life experiment such that you could actually get a second genesis? There's enough stuff there from which would emerge a, a prebiotic form that was very compelling. And we kind of worked out that there are these factors. And just briefly, uh, so the factors Think of them like black boxes in a computer architecture. You start with a mixture of simple kind of molecules floating around. You run them through time, through, through all of these things churning away, and it yields a, what, what I call a milieu, which is a much more sophisticated mixture, which has biological behaviors. It may not be alive, but it's up the chain. So you could think of it as, as this kind of a flow diagram. And what are all these factors? And I won't go them in, in super detail, but it's some of the obvious ones. You need an energy source. Uh, you need something to cycle the system. You have tides, you have heating and cooling, you have all that. You need something to concentrate chemicals so they're not diffusing all over the place and they can get together. You need something called condensation, which means water goes out so that bonds can form, the important bonds and in informational molecules. If you don't have condensation, you're never gonna get those. You need catalytic action, which is like A begets B, which begets C, which begets A. So you can produce lots of A's in a catalytic cycle. That's called metabolism. That's called uh, producing products. You need some kind of coding. You need to be able to form informational molecules. That's coding. You need encoding all over the place. Compartmentalization, things need to be in cells, they need to be in containers, otherwise they just diffuse into the bulk and they're gone. You have to have them. You need, and this is the terms that I brought in for my PhD work, you need combinatorial action. You need to try lots of solutions, over millions of solutions, over and over and over again. You need some kind of climbing mechanism. This is artificial evolution. This is human beings coming in and saying, our machine has just seen a experiment number one million such and such, which we really like, so we're going to make a trillion more of them and run them and look for the, it's still nature doing the emergence because nature produced the results you like. You're then allowing nature to track a vector through a trillion more experiments that you're gonna look at. And you could be completely wrong, but it's a way to do climbing. And one of the, the book authors in the book that I'm putting together called Genesis Engines work at IBM just over here on uh, me millipede memory. And probably none of you remember this project. Millipede memory was where they would take 
atomic force microscope uh, uh, tips, and they would move along and they would read and write memories. A good idea, right? It was highly dense memory. It failed. But one day in the lab, as they were trying to get this thing to work, uh, a bunch of moisture got in, vapor got into the, the box, and suddenly there were droplets hanging off the end of the FM tips, and when they would put them down, the drops that would stay, and they had a whole field of beads, perfect, you know, spherical little beads, and one of our authors just remembered this as being one of the problems, and then when we signed him up for the book, he said, wait a minute, we, we computed we could get a, a trillion of those uh, globules per square inch, and we could, we could move them around. We could combine them. We could put stuff into them. We could t pick them up and go and take them places. And I said, you've just created, that's a system of revolutionized chemistry in the 21st century. Can you imagine? And you can wash them away. So that has become another possibility out of this project doing a trillion experiments at once per square inch inside one of these machines. Uh, the last, of course, is evolution. Zan was talking about did evolution come before uh, life. It probably did. There are chemical, there's a whole center for chemical evolution at Georgia Tech that just studies chemical systems that exhibit Darwinian natural selection. So if evolution kicks in, the sooner it kicks in into your chemical system, the more you're going to drive toward innovation. And there's whole teams that are trying to figure out how can evolution start before life? It, it, it kind of can. It can be in, in the system. So just a few more slides. Uh, we then worked out in any experiment, what do you have to have? What is the lowest level? You have to have energy and you have to have cycling and concentration of some sort. If you want to form molecules with any productivity condensation, and then these are kind of all optional because most people don't have the budget or the time to do the full Monty, to have a system that has all these properties. So most of them are doing a few of those and they're pick a few here, from here, from here, from here, and they're, they're publishing the paper. The concept we have is to, to go back to the original life field and say this is the totality of the space we're working in and that any paper can be described, any, any research project can be described based upon what does it implement from this stack. So for example, you can take these terms and do fun things with them. So for example, compartmentalization promotes condensation and uh, uh, concentration, which thereby promotes coding, the forming of polymers, which and the coding promotes this as well. So you can write these funny terms that show how everything interrelates back and forth. You want to use these terms. Uh, and this, uh, applying this to Dave Deemer's work at, at NASA Astrobiology and at UC Santa Cruz, we wrote this formula. This completely describes his experimental framework and how it works. This one little compact term. So combinatorial action, because he's doing the, the plates rotating around, on compartments, which are these crystal matrices, subject to energy cycling because it's getting wet and dry and wet and dry, promotes concentration and condensation, blah, 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 yielding uh, RNA strands. So this one little term is a way to concisely describe any of these class of origin of life and probably most chemical experiments, but fo focusing on origin of life. Another way of showing it is like, well, this combinatorial cycling helps con compartmentalization, which thereby helps these three things. So that's another way of graphically showing it. Another way of showing it is you start your experiment with some uh, building blocks and some compartments, and then halfway through, you've added energy and cycling, and you get uh, increasing complexity, and then your end product is double-stranded RNA. Another way of showing it as a cycle. So really a versatile language. Uh, last experiment I'll show you, this is a very famous one from Bartel and Shostak in 1993, and this is chemical evolution. This is running ribozymes, trillions of them, through a column, through beads and through cooling and heating and whatnot, and you find that the ribozymes evolve and you have productivity in the ribozymes seven million times more than if you just did a straight <laughs> experiment. 
And so we came up with the compact description of that experiment. And so in the future, you'd have whole flows. This is a blueprint for doing a Genesis engine. So phase one of the work now, which is gonna last probably 50 years, is to get this blueprint language down, get it used in the origin of life field, and then there's a project at McMaster for a million dollars they just received to build a Genesis engine or a piece of it. If uh, I go there and we can convince them to use this nomenclature, everybody be talking the same way, writing blueprints, just as von Neumann's blueprint for his computer was used by everybody. And we'll have a common blueprint, and that maybe in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, there will be some master diagram somebody puts together that they then build the hardware and they put together uh, a true primordial soup comes out of the thing. And I wrote this, uh, this nice ode to the Genesis engine. Oh, Gen and this is the final slide. Oh, Genesis engine, you great Rube Goldberg machine of the 21st century, resplendent with all your pumps, piping chemical soups around, your computer eyes scanning for signs of competing lines of polymer-infused vesicles, and your purring grids of silicon modeling yields, and then selecting experiments to be robotically reseeded. And inside of you one day, perhaps decades hence, an alarm will sound in one lone experiment within your millions of distributed chemo grids. A sample will be rushed for analysis, and scientists will emerge breathlessly, declaring that a second genesis has occurred or rather is in the course of occurring if time and budgets permit you running you for another thousand years. You will leave us all wondering what it all means, but it will mark a major moment for our species as powerful as when our Earth was first photographed from space. For thanks to you, we will know that we are most certainly not alone in the universe, and in some sense we will have made first contact. And I'd like to thank the organizations and people that help support all this work over all these years. And one last thought, closing thought. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Any questions for Bruce? You had a parenthesis. Um, Sorry, was, uh, it, it, Referring to tele teleology, and I wondered what you meant. Yeah, the, here's the, the tricky thing. Teleology is sort of, you kind of know the result you want, so you design something that gets you toward the result you want. And the problem in the in emergent business, especially in chemical emergence, is it's sort of a big trap, because if you said, I know how life started, it's, it's lots of little balls floating around, and this is what trapped some scientists in the 1960s, Sidney Fox being among them, because they saw these balls moving around amphiphilic balls and they would divide and they were like, we're so darn close. So they focused all their experiment, but nobody understood the machinery of the cell at that time. So they didn't realize they had Mount Everest to climb first. The balls were like the minute, the, you know, hardly even the first step. So their entire teleological framework was get all these balls to do their thing, but none, not, no understanding of the mechanism inside. So if you design a genesis engine that's sole focus is to get lots and lots of vesicles to form, you're going to have a great vesicle forming thing, but not a living system when, it come, when you come out of it. And so what Kaufman, Stuart Kaufman has this fantastic new theory called enablement in the biosphere. He calls it no entailing laws. That as soon as life cranks up, physics, you can kind of like, all right, planets are here now. We can use even Newtonian physics to figure out they're going to be here you know, in, on Tuesday of 2023, 20, in a certain month, they're going to be there. You can't do that with biology. As soon as a, a biological form in an ecosystem that's subject to Darwinian natural selection is, is around, it takes all these crazy directions that are unpredictable in any way. They're never predictable. There's enablement to what he calls adjacent possibles. A good example, one example that Stuart uses all the time is the lungfish. The lungfish is this bizarre fish back in the Devonian or some period where it would come up to the surface of the uh, ocean or rivers or whatnot, and it would suck in air. It had a lung to breathe with. So these lungfish were doing pretty well. They weren't very dominant. 
But suddenly one day there was a mutation and the lungfish was unable to expel all the water back out because that's how they, it just had a problem with a flap or something. So you thought it's a doomed lungfish. No. What happened is the innovation that happened as a result of that exploded across the earth within a couple of million years because the lungfish would try to expel all the water, couldn't, and like, oh shit, float back down and then realize, you know, as if the lungfish can realize, that it's now neutrally buoyant. It's got just enough air and just enough water that it's hanging in the water and it's like, I don't have to flap anymore to keep from floating down. I can just chill. I can chill. And so less energy was used. So this lungfish was incredibly successful. And within two, three million years, the swim bladder was born. Neutral buoyancy had never existed in the known universe. It was a new physical property because you can't have neutral buoyancy inside a star or in a, a dead planet. It only exists within a living system. So this is a whole new property of, bi of a biological physics that just exploded, unpredictable, unplanned, and this is how evolution goes. And so that's Stuart's. So in, in the design of Genesis engines, we have to actually make them flexible enough and malleable enough that these molecular systems can go crazy directions within the system and take us in places we just can't design with our you know, puny monkey brains. So that's the answer to the teleological conundrum. Any other questions? Mark? Um, so you had, a, you had a slide that showed a diagram of multiple experiments that you were then combining the results from. Can you put that, do you remember where that was? Yep, I certainly can. Let's... Oh, I'll go back to, oh, it's further down. Uh... Did I just go to the start? Yeah, this one uh, was down in the, there we are coming into, there we are. Oh. That one. So I have two questions about that. Um, the first is, if you were to do that, how much of the game would you be giving away by giving it that structure, by setting up that structure from the mm. beginning mm -hmm. in the experiment? That's question number one. And question number two is, um, how, how much can you use um, the examples, the example of life that we have in front of us to guide the simulation? So let me, let me uh, ask a version of that question. So you've, you've abandoned using digital simulation mm -hmm. for sort of the foundation of it. Um, but imagine that you were, you know, before you had shifted to uh, this sort of hybrid system, combined system. How far are we from being able to simulate, not evolve uh, a cell, but to even simulate a cell? Oh. <laughs> how many, how many? Generations. Oh, it's so far off. Well, human, human generations? Human, human generations. So get an example. Uh, Anton, which is a supercomputer built by David E. Shaw in New York. He was a He's a financial bad guy gone good. He helped create, um, what was it, the, not the junk bonds, the whole hedge funds in the 80s. But he was a science guy from Columbia. So he sold his business for billions of dollars, kept his building in Manhattan, and packed it with scientists. And they built the world's greatest uh, protein uh, simulator. And it has like 10,000 or 20,000 ASICs in it. It's a huge cube. And, and they announced, this was a couple of years ago, it was like a folding of a protein having 5,000 atoms, uh, doing a two nanosecond fold sequence, you know, with the bulk phase, with water bouncing around on it. This is in simulation. And in two nanoseconds, they did it in only three weeks of flat out calculation. Three weeks. And there's 30,000 kinds of um, enzyme proteins in your one cell on human, 30,000 types. And so they're so happy about these little point successes because, you know, one protein fold can be done in a reasonable time and characterize the protein without denaturing it. And, and that's the best we've got. And so a living, uh, 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 
the bulk phase of just the water, minerals, a bunch of amphiphiles, um, enough, uh, enough of a sort of marine environment or a coastal environment or a hot spring environment to, to simulate digitally to have any kind of reasonable complexity is, is a billion times bigger than that. It's just so much bigger. That's why I threw my hands up on the park bench in Montpellier. <laughs> like, and and why, why do it when we have perfectly good chemicals that are willing to do it in real time for us? Back to the question about how much does, how much does this sort of structure focus an experiment? This, well, ironically, on Thursday I met with, with Dave, and we started to think about this now that we are coming up with this language. And he said, here are the four experiments that I would chain together from these four um, Shostak's group. This one from Gerald Joyce, this one guy from Rode in Germany who's doing using salts. And he says, they, they tie together. You can have the outputs of this one go on to the inputs of this one. And so it started to make sense to us that this, this is even plausible. But you'd have to put them in one machine. And that machine would have to be so doggone flexible it could really run any experiment. And so it would have you know, it would be able to reconfigure itself to use its, its arrays to do a numerous types of experiments. And one of the concepts is if you could get it, so Dave's experience with this because he, he made a discovery in the 80s that led to nanopore sequencing. So in the 80s they were in the lab and they had a membrane and there was pores in the membrane and suddenly a bunch of DNA that was on one side of the membrane was on the other side. It just got there. It's like instead of saying, well, I'll just wipe the slide. It's, no, no, this is amazing. And it turns out the, the, enzyme, the, the DNA had found itself up against a pore and it had corkscrewed its way through. And what they ended up designing was a clicker, a molecular clicker mechanism that would change potentials as different base pairs went by. And it would click, click, and it would count individual base pairs. And last uh, February... Nan Oxford Nanopore in Florida at a conference held up a box saying this box will sequence the human genome in two hours using nanopore sequencing and that's all coming to market now. So the idea is to uh, build that kind of stuff into this. Now how many generations are we talking about? That's the recognizing the, Yeah, the, the, if you get any kind of polymer you can have a box in there that's really small that will do the immediate counting of what you just got. So rather than doing mass spec and TLC plates and all this, you can do direct counting of the molecular contents. Really tough stuff. I mean, the, the detection alone is hard. But the goal would be, say, by the year 2050, you could have a box that you could put in your basement, pour your coffee into, just in, in good old back to the future, <laughs> as coffee is everything you need. Um, takes it all apart, and then it would do a little piece of the Origin of Life project, which would then publish to the internet, and then other Genesis engines would pick up and, and carry on bigger units. So you could have distribute this all over the planet and plug them into different wall sockets and do a massive distributing kind of SETI type. This is SETI in reverse, because it's trying to, to show how life might have started. Um, one of the long-term things is if we get really good at this in 500 years, we'll be able to have a Genesis engine, this goes back to some of your work at NASA, and say, okay, we're going to now sim we're going to put in not a simulation, but a piece of Martian ice cap. You know, we're going to make it. We don't have to go get it and bring it back and sample return, but we're going we're gonna to now take a million pieces of Martian ice cap and we're going to run this thing to see what life could have emerged in such environments. So it's like a telescope or a microscope on where in the universe could life actually come. And then we come up with a gradient of, oh, life could be quite common because we found it emerges quickly in these environments, a little slower in these environments, and not at all in those environments. It's a crazy idea. And then flipping it around, say, well, given that we just showed an, a, a genesis in a piece of uh, frozen carbon dioxide or water from Mars, and an organism is now happily tunneling its way through that piece of simulacrum, we can actually ship it to Mars, and it's totally at home. It's done, the, the terraforming thing. We just evolve organism after organism to, do, to make habitable places. 
And any civilization that's worth its salt probably has harnessed the power of evolution to do just that. You know, they've got the best nerds working on it. Any more questions for Bruce? Well, thank you, Bruce. Most welcome.